Hello everyone and welcome to this latest talk on coppers, which is almost two years after the last one that I did. Um, so sorry about the delay, a difficult third album and all that. Um, as you can imagine I got caught up with a, another few bits and pieces, so uh, it's taken a while to get around to doing the third in the series of copular talks. Now, um, what I'm going to do this time is just upload the videos straight to YouTube rather than trying to do things live because I think I had technical issues every time I tried to do um, a live stream. What this does mean is that the videos will need to be a little bit more bite-sized, um, but hopefully they'll still be um, understandable and at least not uh, in unintelligible for technical reasons. So the last couple of talks I've done what I've talked about is what a copula is and how you can evaluate a copula, um, how they work, why they work, some of the principles behind them, that kind of thing. What I'm going to do now is talk about how you can actually choose the right copula for your purposes, how you can work out what parameters that copula should have and how you can tell if it's even a good fit for the data. Now, this is going to run over several videos and this first one is going to be mainly around um, some of the considerations that you might want to have when trying to answer these sorts of questions. So choosing, parameterizing and fitting copulas. What I'm going to try and do is run through each of those things over the course of the next few videos. Um, there are several aspects to this challenge. Um, you've got to choose the right copula for the job. You need to try to fit data to the copula that you've chosen and you need to see if that copula is a good fit to the data. But these steps are not independent. Um, how do you know whether you've chosen the right copula for the job without actually fitting the data? I mean, you, there are ways that you can guess whether it's right for the job, but um, sometimes you need to go a little bit further. And if you want to see if the copula is a good fit for the data, well, you've actually got to have fitted it first. So what this means is there's several different starting points for the purpose of uh, parameterizing, fitting, choosing um, a copula. And then some are more appropriate for some types of copulas than they are for, for others. Now, because uh, I'm an actor and I like to categorize things, um, I've tried to break it down to two broad approaches to choosing a copula, a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. Now, the, the top-down approach um, this is really based on trying to choose a copula based on the high level features of the data. So you decide exactly what kind of data you've got and, and what things you're more interested in. Um, and then you fit the data to the copula that you've chosen. But the, the bottom up approach is slightly different in that you simply fit the data to a range of possible copulas and then you look at how good those copula fits are and you choose the copula accordingly. So the top-down approach for an elliptical copula. So the starting point here is the, is the correlation structure. Um, and basically, if you've got a complex and granular correlation structure, so you've got different correlations for every pair of variables that you're looking at, that might mean you want to use an elliptical copula. Um, so something like a Gaussian or normal copula or, or a T copula. Now, um, if you really do have this level of knowledge and a desire to use this level of knowledge uh, with the data, then this kind of copula might be for you. But you've got to recognise that evaluating these copulas can be tricky. One of the things about anything elliptical is there's pretty much no closed form solution to work out probabilities. You've got to rely on tables that other people have built or um, some kind of um, quantitative methods to, to derive the probability. So, so it's not straightforward. And you also need to recognise that sometimes complex correlation structures um, might be excessive. You know, how much confidence you actually have in these correlations that you've got. And as we'll see later, there is actually a way you can uh, work out how much confidence you should have in, in your correlations. Another top-down approach is the Archimedean approach. So for this, you're using um, a single parameter or, or a limited number of parameters anyway. And what this implies is you've got a single average correlation 
across all the pairs of variables that you're using, which might be because you haven't got that much confidence in the correlations, and that might imply an Archimedean copula, so something like a Clayton or a Frank or a Gumbel copula. And if this uh, whole area is not familiar to you, then I'd encourage you to go back and have a look at the um, earlier talks I did, which explain Archimedean copulas in, in some detail. Now, one of the things about an Archimedean copula is it is described in terms of its distribution function and not its density function. So Gaussian copulas, elliptical copulas, they're all defined in terms of the density function. To work out a probability, you need to have a distribution function. So that means trying to work out for a Gaussian or a T copula what the probability is getting from that density function to the distribution function. Archimedean copula, that's already sorted for you. The whole thing is already um, a distribution function already, so it's much easier to evaluate probabilities from an Archimedean copula, which, which also makes it attractive. Now, another thing you can use when you're trying to decide what kind of copula to use or which copula to use is, is something like tail dependence. And, and tail dependence is the extent to which two data sets are still correlated right at the limit. So when you get to the very bottom left corner of a distribution or joint distribution, so the very smallest values or the very largest values, at the limit is there actually still any correlation? So if the lower um, measure of tail dependence um, you're calculating the value of the copula for a particular quantile, Q, and dividing the value of the quantile as it tends to Q from zero from above. So you're evaluating the copula, um, which is uh, that C brackets F of QX, F of QY, which means you're looking at um, variable X and you're working out what the probability is at um, value Q, you're working out what the value for Y is um, at Q as well, calculating the copula for that, and then dividing it by Q. And then the coefficient of lower tail dependence is the limit of that function as Q gets smaller and smaller from above. And the upper is the same, but it is um, looking at the top right corner. So if, if you imagine you've got um, uh, you've got a chart, you've got x going across, y going up, uh, so it's this kind of thing, that kind of thing from where you're looking. Uh, what that will mean is for lower tail dependence, you're looking in this bottom corner here. For upper tail dependence, you're looking in this top corner here. So what that means is you need to use a survival copula instead, which is a bit like one minus copula, and you're dividing it by one minus q. That's probably a little bit complicated at the moment to think about survival copulas, so let's just concentrate on the lower tail dependence calculation. And, and an example might make it a little bit clearer as to what's going on. So, say you've got perfect correlation between X and Y, so all the dots fall on a straight diagonal line. Um, what that means is that the copula for uh, the lower 10%, or the, say the lowest 10% of X and the lowest 10% of Y, well, actually, 10% of all observations fall into that. So the value of the copula is 0.1. Q is 0.1. The coefficient of tail dependence is 1. Because even as you shrink those lower and lower and lower, sorry, lower and lower and lower, you'll still get the same value, which would, be, which would be 1. If you move to less than perfect correlation, like this, and you're looking at, again, say the bottom 10%, the bottom 10% of X and Y, so that's the value of the copula. You see you've only got four dots here. Um, in the lower 10%. So that will give you um, 0 0.04 divided by 0 0.1. So you've only got 40% um, tail dependence. So your coefficient of tail dependence is, is less than 1. So if you have a view on tail dependence, this can help inform you which copula you might want to use. Now, how does it inform you? Well, there are actually formulae to explain what the tail dependence is for different copulas. So bizarrely, for a Gaussian or a normal copula, both the lower and upper coefficients of tail dependence are zero. So at the margin, right at the end, there is no tail dependence. For the T copula, um, it's actually a positive number, which is based on the T distribution function um, evaluated 
on uh, nu, which looks like a v, uh, degrees of freedom, and with a correlation coefficient of theta, which isn't necessarily the correlation between the variables. It's, uh, as we'll see later, it's, a, it's a slightly more complicated than that, but, but there is a number for it. Um, the Gumbel copula doesn't have lower tail dependence, but it has upper tail dependence. The Clayton copula it doesn't have upper tail dependence, but it has lower tail dependence. And the Frank copula doesn't have any tail dependence at all. So if you think you've got um, particular um, levels of tail dependence, or, or even ones that you're more worried about. So for example, if you're looking at um, equity returns, then you might think a Clayton copula is more what you want to look at because um, joint bad losses is more important and probably more likely than joint good returns. Whereas if you're looking at, say, insurance claims, then maybe a Gumball copper is more appropriate because when claims are going high, that might be when they're more grouped together, where they're more likely to happen, or at least when you're, you're more concerned about that happening. So, so this can help inform what kind of copula you might want to use. So how do you calculate tail dependence? Well, it's evaluated at the limit. So if you're trying to calculate tail dependence from the data, that means you have to work it out based on decreasing amounts of data. So what you can do is you can calculate that um, value of the copula divided by the quantile and just keep reducing Q to see what happens to the number. And I've got a couple of equity indices that I've done it for here. And you can see that that number stays fairly constant for upper and lower tail dependence at around 0 0.6 to 0 0.7. And then as you reduce Q lower and lower, so you're actually, actually going to the left-hand side of the chart, um, you find that the values start to climb very slightly towards 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 before kind of going all over the place, dropping off because there's not enough data. So that suggests that um, the coefficient of lower tail dependence and upper tail dependence for, for this set of data is probably around the 0 0.7, 0 0.8 mark. Now I'm going to leave it there for now um, for this first video. When we come back, we'll start to look a little bit more about parameterization, the way in which you can parameterize different copulas. Hopefully that's useful. Um, like, comment, subscribe, or whatever it is they say. And uh, if you do have any questions, put them in the comments, and I'll see what I can do to help. See you next time.